Okay, here we go. Animals Without a Backbone, Part 6. This should be the one that wraps it all up here. I know, big lecture, but just a lot of stuff out there in regards to animals without a backbone. Uh, so we were talking about Echinodermata. Key features, this water vascular system, this pentaradial body plan, all those general features, respiration, endoskeleton, etc. That's what make up the echinoderms. This group is big. There's a lot in it. Uh, so what I want to do is break it down into the main classes. And these are all marine animals, so we can expect to see all of these in a marine environment. So our first class is class Asteroidea. These are the sea stars. When we look at sea stars, big defining feature is that they have these two feet on the bottom of their body, or what we call the oral side of the body. Okay, underneath. So what you're looking at right now is the top side, or aboral side, A-B-O-R-A-L, versus oral. Oral meaning mouth. The bottom part. That's where the mouth is, and that's where all the tube feet are at. So the tube feet serve a bunch of purposes. Movement, but also feeding as well. I'll show you that in the next slide here. There's a central disc in the center of the body that is then going to be surrounded by arms, generally five. That's what most sea stars are going to have are five arms, but we will see some examples where you have more than five. But here's your disc, that little circle in the center, and then one, two, three, four, five. So again, some of these guys up to 50 arms. If we get really close with a microscope and looked at the body, we would also see these little things called pedicellaria. Now, a pedicellaria is a pincher-like structure that is used to clean the body of the sea star. So they use that to help pick debris off of their back and keep themselves clean. Most sea stars are going to be carnivores. They actually eat mollusks. They'll find bivalves and pry them open, slide their stomach into the bivalve, secrete digestive enzymes, and then kill it. So people who harvest oysters and clams and scallops do not like sea stars. They can be very damaging and detrimental to those industries. Now, when we look at the body plan, I mentioned the term a boral. Okay, so that's what we have here, a boral. That means the top. The oral surface down here means the bottom. There's your mouth. There's all your tube feet. All those structures are on the, uh, the oral surface of the sea star. So we've got our tube feet and our mouth here on the oral surface. The top side, though, has an important structure. The a boral surface has a structure known as the madre pore. Now, the madre pore is important when we talk about that water vascular system. So, water enters the madre pore, goes down through this ring canal. Once it gets to a certain arm, it goes then down the radial canal, which is the second part. In the radial canal, it shoots out into all of these tiny, tiny little bulbs called ampullae. Now, the ampullae are kind of like a pipette. They fill up with water, and then they squeeze. And when they squeeze, that water pushes out these little structures known as the tube feet. So it extends out. When the water relaxes, the muscles relax, the tube foot comes back in. So sea stars have thousands and thousands of these little tube feet located on their oral surface that they use for movement and for feeding. Big, big features when we look at asteroidia. The next class are the brittle stars. This is known as class ophoroidea. And these guys will have a central disc. surrounded 
by very flexible arms. Okay, so really long, skinny, flexible arms. Sea star arms are not nearly as flexible. All their internal organs are located in that central disc part of the body, kind of centered right in the center there. And when we look at brittle stars, they use their tube feet to capture, oh, capture detritus, little stuff floating around in the water. So they're not active predators. Generally, you're going to find these guys under rocks, in crevices. So they're detritivores, eating stuff off the bottom. So an important part of the community and ecosystem as a detritivore. But what's fun and interesting, if you look at this one here, notice this foot or this arm is shorter. It's because it broke off. And this tip here is regenerating. So that's a neat thing about a lot of the uh, echinoderms is they can actually regenerate. They can regrow limbs, regrow body parts, and reproduce asexually through regeneration. Our next class is echinoidea. The echinoderms that fit into echinoidea are going to be sea urchins and sand dollars. Now, big feature here is that they have this round test or shell structure. So when you're looking at them and we look at this guy here, this is a variegated urchin, looks almost like a little pincushion. Here's our sand dollar. Notice the round shape, the round test. They still have the pentaradial system. So you look at this guy, one, two, three, four, five. A little more difficult to see in the urchin here, but circle, one, two, three, four, five. Pentaradial system. But it's based on that round shell or test structure that we find in the urchins and the sand dollars, members of the echinoidea. So the spines on them are going to be movable. So these, these little extensions sticking off here, these little things, these are spines that they can move. They can use to pick up algae and marine plants to help use them as camouflage. We'll see some called diademas. These guys are known as the black urchins, and they use those spines to protect themselves. They're like a big, giant, moving pincushion. They have tube feet that sit on the bottom of their structure. The oral surface, which is the underneath side that's near the sand. They move around with those tube feet, picking up food. Most of these guys are going to be herbivores or detritivores. The mouth is on the bottom. They bring food in, they digest it, and then they excrete the waste out the anus on the top of their body or the what we're calling the aboral surface. So herb herbivores and detritivores for this particular group. Not, we really don't see any carniv carnivores here. Okay, so there's a better picture of what these guys look like. There's the test and the shell. There's the water vascular system with the tube feet located underneath on the oral surface. These are all the spines. Again, those things can move around. And with the diadema, the neat thing is they move them in response to shadows. So they direct them always towards the predator. The predator is creating a shadow above the animal itself. Okay, urchins. Um, last class. Sea cucumbers. No, I'm sorry, second from last class. Sea cucumbers here. Class Holothuroidea. These are sea cucumbers weird. They look like big worms. Okay, so they have this elongated body, worm-like body covered with a thick skin. So you pick one up and it feels like a big worm that's got a real tough, thick skin on it. The two feet, five rows, pentaradial, are all underneath on the bottom of it, the oral surface. 
Um, the skin's got actually these little calcareous spicules embedded into it, which help provide a layer of protection and support for the animal. And um, these guys are what we call deposit feeders. Best way is to call them detritivores. They filter sand. So they consume sand, sand moves through their digestive system, they poop out clean sand, and they filter out all the nutrients from it. So they have an ecological role that is very, very similar to that of an earthworm. Uh, and the last feature to mention about the sea cucumbers is this thing called evisceration. This means they can expel their internal organs. So when they're threatened, they shoot their internal organs out to distract the predator. And the predator says, oh, wow, look at this, a nice warm meal. I'm going to eat that. And then the sea star kind of slinks away and goes and hides and then regenerates its internal organs. So again, some interesting features. If you ever have the opportunity, check out the sea cucumber. There's one called the donkey dung. Looks like a big donkey turd and it has this weird relationship with the pearl fish so we'll talk a bit about that when we get into ecological relationships in the marine ecosystem so, okay now last class i promise last class last group to talk about with the animals without backbones lecture these are the crinoidea or crinoids crinoids have either five, usually have five or more arms that branch out for suspension feeding. So they wave these arms around, they look like little feathers down there, and they grab food out of the water. A lot of crinoids are very, very deep species. The group called the sea lilies typically live in the deep, deep parts of the marine ecosystem, and they just filter feed on whatever's floating in the water way down in the bottom there. The one on the right down here, these guys here, are known as feather stars. These can actually move around, crawl around on the bottom. Um, they generally live in the shallow areas of the reef and they do the same thing as they filter feed. They just kind of pull whatever they can out of the water, pull it in to their mouth, digest the material. So we call them suspension feeders or you could also refer to a lot of these guys as filter feeders. All right now most of us know crinoids as a thing called Indian beads. They are very common fossils. If you have a pile of limestone or crushed rock in your driveway or on the road and you start looking through it and you find these little ring-like circular structures, quite often those are crinoids. So. Okay, so those are all of the marine animals without backbones. There are two more slides here. I would encourage you guys use these as kind of your shortcut when you're looking at what is a key feature for the groups we've talked about. You know, we talked about periphera and we named a bunch of different features. This can help. Big thing is, yeah, they don't have true tissues. We talked about nadarians. They got radial symmetry and so on and so on. Work your way through the main ones that we've been talking about. So kind of just using this as a visual guide to the relatedness between the major phylum of the marine animals. Again, some of these don't worry about. We didn't cover it. We didn't talk about them. You can cross them out. No, we didn't do arrow worms. We didn't do those guys. So you can go through here and kick out certain ones and not even worry about some of these guys, but others you definitely want to make sure you're comfortable with. Um, the other slide I put out here for us is just a chart. Uh, I would zoom in on it, enlarge the font, make it a little easier for you guys to read these, but uh, see if that helps, again, to just reinforce some of those key things about the marine animals without 